Oh, we're going to be off. We're getting off. <laughs> yeah, we are. So, hello and welcome to Cross's Corner, everybody uh, that will be tuning in or watching this. I'm Martin Cross, and with me is an extraordinary woman, Sarah Winkless, been dying to chat to for, for a long time on Cross's Corner, and glad it's finally worked out. Hiya, Sarah. Hi Martin, lovely to be here. Yeah, I feel like I'm on um, a bit wonky, so sorry about that if anyone's watching this. <laughs> I can't usually see my face when I'm online. Ah, well, here you go. Um, so just before we get started, just a word about our sponsors. Um, as most of you know, regular listeners, that Crosses Corner is supported by Ludum. That's a performance management uh, software tool, uh, performance analysis for coaches and sports groups as well. And the good news is you can get a free trial, free 30-day trial just by going to ludum.com and following the instructions. And I guess somebody will put the, the little link below as we get started. So, so Sarah, we're going to get into lots of things today, uh, but how's, how's your day been today? Looking forward to it, Martin. It's been really good, actually. I'm enjoyed a bit of quieter weather a bit of rain as well as that heat i've been out with the dog this morning i've been working at my computer as all of us do at the moment um i can't remember what else i've been up to it feels like one of those sort of bitty days a prep day not a delivery day for me oh wow so um let, let, let's get straight into the, the rowing um you, you were um, a very talented athlete at school and at university, but Rome wasn't your first choice, I gather. No, Martin, I had a, a dad and a stepdad that were rowers, and I think <laughs> I'd watched my dad coach many, many talented rowers, and my stepdad race, and I had even been in skiffs when I was a preteen, if you like. I'd learned to cox, I'd learned to row those boats, some Greek kids regatta. I did that, and I enjoyed... All, all of that competition. So it was kind of well set up to be a rower. And then I got to the teenage years and I just thought, I, I want variety. I want yeah. to try lots of things. And I found athletics um, and I became a member of Exxon and Your Harriers. And I ended up spending my weekends throwing the discus, running around a track. I loved my school netball team. I do you know, I was at Chickman Girls School and the first year we had 90, I think we only had 120 girls and 99 girls signed up to be part of that team. And the wow. year, I remember there was about 70, there was real enthusiasm. And then really sadly, by the third year, the team almost was self-selected because there was only <laughs> the wrong number um, saying that we would do it. And I, I look at that and you think, what happened to those... 90 odd other women who wanted to do sport when they were 11, 12 years old and were turned off it as they went through. And as, as with the netball team, I, I loved it. We became national netball champions in that team when I was in my um, fifth year, so 16 years old. And then I went to Millfield and Millfield, I did kept the athletics. I did some more basketball and I played netball. But sadly, wow. I snapped my anterior cruciate ligament playing netball. So I damaged my body while I, while I was there. And I think that's part of the reason why I changed to rowing. I, I finished Millfield, got my A-levels, kept the discus going, tried to go to the Commonwealth Games, grew far enough, didn't get selected, went to Cambridge and, and finally, finally started rowing. So was it, did someone just come and nab you? Like, you know, you're a, tall, you're a tall lady, right, we'll have you. Or did you just sign up to the boat club? Mikey Roberts, I can name and shame him. Uh, he came and grab me. I was lucky enough to be, my father was at Cambridge, he'd been at the college, so he'd been there coaching the boat. I think I walked in and they already knew who my dad was and that I could, that I could possibly row. I played blues netball that first year. I did blues athletics because those are my two sports that I was, um, really well trained in but I also started doing college rowing and I, I actually lied to my dad I told him I was going running instead of going rowing because I think he'd seen me so long work towards the discus and become this explosive athlete the last thing he wanted me to do was I damage myself or change my physiology through just playing at rowing so I told him I was running instead of rowing every day 
And that worked really well until he got <laughs> invited to speak at what they call the Fairbones Dinner. That was my first ever event. And I realised I was going to be there in the programme. So I had to very quickly find an excuse and tell him that I'd been magically selected for the first boat. And I was going to race in Fairbones three days later, which I'm not sure he believes me. Hopefully not watching this. Sorry, Dad. I lied to him. Uh, so um, how long did it take you to get selected for the for the blue boat? So that I, I started to work at that first year and at the end of that summer was uh, the timeline that I didn't go to the Commonwealth Games and that meant that I stayed in Cambridge and actually I did what Cambridge called Dev Squad, which meant I got to do the Nash Chance, which at that time was in the summer, in an eight. And that was an incredible experience. And then because that hooked me and I guess I was slightly known within the Cambridge system by then, I came back and somehow I got selected for the Blue Boat that very next year, which was terrifying because I had spent 10 years developing my netball skills to become a blue. I spent more than that doing my track and field skills to become a blue. And I, whilst wasn't confident in the results, I was confident in my ability to produce a performance on the day. And on that first race in the blue boat, and, and I'm very good friends with the girls I was I was racing with and our, and our cops who was a male, but I was not confident. I was not confident. Really? was able to produce the performance i was still learning the sport and, and we know the sport when it's done well looks easy and effortless but we all know that how quickly it can go wrong if you're not not as skilled as you should be and just a week before we've been doing some practice starts and i've caught a crab off one of the starts and i you know can you imagine if as a i'd never been in a sport martin that if you have a bad moment you can affect the outcome of the whole performance because in a netball match you have a bad moment you can get it back yeah. this group, you know you, you you get six throws you get three at least and then you you get three more if you've done well enough in those first three or certainly that's how it used to work and in a basketball match you know, bad moments can happen all the time and good moments happen all the time but rowing as we know as we all know that those those moments of lack of concentration can if you catch the crab can shift the outcome of, of a race and i was i was really scared well how did you cope with it i kept thinking about breathing <laughs> 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 that morning i honestly we raced at henley so our race was only seven minutes six seven minutes long we had ron needs who many of um, the listeners will know well, who was part of our coaching and Roger Silk. So they were a famous duo and they'd done it lots of times before. And a week before when we did the practice, we practiced what the day would be like. Um, but it was much, much scarier. So I remember I got up, I looked at the wind, it was quite windy if I, if I remember that day. We then went for a pre-paddle, that all kind of went okay. And then there's the down times and they were the bits that I hadn't got ready for and my nerves were through the roof absolutely through the roof and and genuinely I just thought about breathing I remember my PE teacher saying breathe out because your body will always breathe back in ah. it keeps you alive so I just and if we look now with mindfulness and centering it was actually not a bad technique but um yeah lots of breathing out and then Ron did a a talk for us and we were second favorites we had um, been beaten by oxford in the head um about 10 12 days before the race by by a significant margin and we were a young and experienced crew that we had some pockets of experience in there and i think ron wasn't sure we were going to do our best and so he kind of gave us this talk that was a sort of you know, you, you can do a start because you, you've done it well. I've seen you do it well last Sunday. I mean, not, not the one that you caught the crab there, but you, know, you did it before that well. And I'm thinking, oh my God, the crab, just remember the crab. And then he was, well, I mean, you need to hit a rhythm. You do need to hit a rhythm because this is a rhythm-based sport. And if you don't hit a rhythm, you'll blow up. So try and hit a good rhythm because you did that well at 26 last week. And today I want you to do it at 36. So he's not even talking about race yeah. pace. And then he goes, well, you're quite fit and I've trained you quite hard. So 
you know, if you're in the clutch at the end, try sprinting, you might put them off. And then you left. <laughs> Can you I, I've told that story, to, and I don't know if he was an idiot or a genius, and I wouldn't suggest any coaches perhaps use that technique. But actually, I think as he walked away, we kind of looked at each other and we were like, we thought, we thought Ron was going to fix it for us. And he's just told us if, if we're in touch near the end, sprint. And, <laughs> and I think, well, it didn't help my nerves, I can tell you that. But he, what I think he did was he made us come together as a crew at that moment. We realised that Ron wasn't going to change how we felt or our outcome. We know. Yeah. And there was just a different focus. And as even we lift, put our hands in the boat and lifted the boat away, it just felt like we were more of a crew. And I think between the nine of us, we decided that if we were going to lose, we we're going to lose on our best day. And yeah, it was it was an extraordinary warm up. The boat felt different. Yeah. We went 40 million strokes a minute, and somehow I kept hold of the, the water, <laughs> got through the first three strokes, I was delighted. And then we got to halfway, and we were length up, and none of our thinking, none of our scenarios had imagined that we were going to be a length up. And I remember the cops going, this is brilliant, Sarah, show me your strength. And I showed them everything I had. And then, you know, realised we had three more minutes to go, and I might die. Um, but we managed to hold on and we won that race and for me crossing that finish line i felt better higher more connected to a sports team than pro possibly i ever had before and wow me. it absolutely got me hooked on this wow one. i desperately wanted to be better and to be able to support my crew better um and and i kept back coming back and practicing and, and trying to do that or intending to do that how how were you with nerves when as your career progressed were they were they ever as bad as that or or did you get on top of them so i think they were once as bad as that and it was when i got first got in the squad i got into the squad i done my first world championships and i don't know if you remember martin but in 97 when the women's aid got brought yeah I yeah eight, i didn't get selected i got selected for it in 98 and we um came eight we came eight at the world championships and it really wasn't the performance that we wanted or dreamt of to build off that bronze and i think i was ready to step away from the sport i thought i'd oh really as i was I personally not made the eight go faster. It it probably was for me to go and get a real job and, and step away. And I was lucky enough that I had been selected for um, the World Student Games in Zagreb. And I was selected in my single. And I remember going to that. And obviously my confidence is in my boots. It has yeah. been a good world championship. And now I'm about to be, I, I genuinely, genuinely thought I had destroyed the women's eight and certainly had oh, wow. faster. And now I'm about to be found out on an international stage in my single. So you can only imagine I turn up at Zagreb, my brain is all over the place. I can't even take him. And I know I'm an umpire, but don't ever admit this. I didn't even look at the circulation pattern. <laughs> <laughs> other people on the lake and just that that my my dad came out to watch me which was brilliant and i remember him looking at me and i was like that I, I can't i can't even do this time i'm so so scared and i got myself at the right time in the circulation pattern onto the start and i remember starting that race martin and just going coming off and just all i could think about was trying to be in my lane and just praying that I didn't fall in. And I got to about, I think it was probably 500. And I remember counting the, the singles behind me because I wasn't last. And it was one, two, three, four, five. And I was thinking, is this a second <laughs> race? Is this, am, am I winning? And I dropped the rate to 28 and rode away from an international field in my single skull. And it was the heat. Wow. But, I won it, and I I ended up coming second to Rumi uh, by 0.4 of a second in that race, and that was the pivotal point that kept me coming back for another 
10 years because something had clearly gone wrong with us in the women's eight in that first year. Yeah. They're talented group of women. We were talented group of women, but we didn't produce the performance we dreamt of. But it wasn't just me. It was a system. It was yeah. time. And so I came back and, um, yeah, kept have another go. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about the the Sydney year because I know that was a tough year for you and, and for many women in, in the squad that year. Mm. Um, you were in the quad and then you had an injury and then you, you weren't in the quad for the games. You were in the double with Franny Houghton. Um, mm. How did that leave any scars for you that year or, or how did you deal with it? Because it was, I, I know it was pretty mm. difficult situation yeah and, and massive deep scars i think is the, the the truth for me i my my start of my international career as i've just shared wasn't the dream start and i came back in 99 and i got us myself into the quad we qualified for the, those games it was yeah. we came seventh the world championships to qualify it was the last qualification place and that heat and in that final race, we had to beat the Belarusians, which we'd never beaten um, at, in our in our lives in that quad. And we had a fantastic race um, that got us that qualification space. You know, again, we were up at 250, 500, and, and the boat sang for us. And that started to give me real confidence. And going into the Olympic year, I began to realize I could become an Olympian. And then we started to be in the quad and we started to get medals at World Cup and I started to believe I could be a really successful Olympian. And yeah, then yeah, yeah. Six weeks before I broke my rib. Uh, I broke my rib training a number of times in, in a day and got a stress fracture. And that meant that I came out of the quad, Gillian Lindsay came in and Fran, Ken and I got to race the double. And Francis is a fantastic um, athlete, but we didn't have the time, the preparation and the development together to do that double justice. And I can only imagine how it was for Fran because I was not at my best. Let's be completely honest. I was coming back from an injury. I was disappointed with where I was. And I, I'm sure if I look myself in the mirror now and I think about what she had to, to grow with, it, it probably wasn't great for, great for her. And I, we, we came ninth. It was as good as we could do at yeah. that time. And the next day, the quad raced, and I went to the lake and I hid behind the stands because I really, really wanted them to do well, Martin. Yeah. I really, really wanted them to do badly as well. I mean, I think it's. Yeah, I know that feeling. Nature. It's, yeah. and, and hopefully I'd matured. But you know, I, I wanted to be in that that quad at that time and I wanted to be on in the final and have a chance at a, at a medal and it took me 24 hours to say well done to them um yeah because I didn't want my emotion to be ruining their day um so yeah it did and, and the next year I think the lesson I in life maybe need to learn or keep learning is when I'm disappointed I tend to work harder and what that can result in is my body breaking down. So I came back in 2001 and I, when I say deep scars, I was every day just carrying that monkey on my back, if you like, yeah, yeah, yeah. not being in that race. And so I was racing from that place and my body kept breaking down. And unsurprisingly, I actually ended up taking 2001 off. I went and had a bit of time away from the sport and I, yeah. came and I did some skipping, actually went back to what that no. was pre-team had done and um, raced in, in skiffs and just had some fun in boats, just enjoyed being on the water, let my body recover. Yeah. And then, then I came came back from it. But yeah, it was a tough one for me. Yeah. So it, it must have meant, I know you, you went through a, um, a couple of seasons in, in the quad um, where mm -hmm. you were in the final. Um, you, you, were selected in the double for the Athens Olympics. Uh, how different was that experience to the Sydney experience for you? And, and you, can, that, you can see the smile on my face. Yeah. It was complete. So I was lucky enough in 2001. And as well, one of the things David Tanner did when I said I needed some time off was he supported me in that. And he said, there's this sports psychologist, Britt Tadgett Foxhall, 
And I'd really like you to speak with her because I think she's brilliant and she absolutely is brilliant at helping athletes, but particularly when you have injuries, and particularly when you're coming out of injuries. And what Britt had done was she had um, made me scan my body and look at it, visualize it. And I was still seeing the broken rib as a different color. It was absolutely wow. amazing. So I sort of scanned down my right hand side, which hadn't been broken, and I saw my rib cage visually as a normal rib cage. She said, Look at your left. And so I kind of thought, you know, I'll do what I'm told. This is a sports <laughs> psychologist. And so I looked at my left, and the rib that had been broken, I saw was gray. And <sighs> All the others as white. It was fascinating, and she wow. had to put it out and put it back as white. And so I did that session, which was absolutely phenomenal. And then I kept working with her. So when I went to Athens, one Elise and I had had a good season in the double. It was yeah. uh, I'd managed to stab my hand uh, uh, putting a uh, avocado pip out just before. Oh the- no. I know, don't, I'm really bad. You don't go back to your double time. Like, oh, I've got three stitches. They're called Bill, Bob and Freddie. Um, so, we, so our Lucerne result wasn't as good as we wanted, but I'd had stitches in my hand while we were racing. So it was it was tricky uh, to be as dexterous as you needed to be. And we still came forth. So we were in a good position. We were working really well with Miles Bob Thomas. We got to Athens and I just felt at home. I was massively oh. that it was the home of the Olympic Games. Yeah, yeah. Where Pierre Coubertin had taken, restarted the, the modern Olympics. And on the very, very first time we went down to the lake, we there was loads of people out and we didn't really know what was going on. Those traffic jams, it was six in the morning. And I was thinking, my God, <laughs> what do you think the Greeks were going to be into the Games? But they're really into the Games. Yeah, yeah. And I realised actually what we were doing was it was the Olympic torch, it was the relay, and it was coming past us at that particular moment because we were, the, the lake was on the marathon route. And so that was just amazing. Yeah. And I remember looking around the bus and, you know, what rowers are like, we want to get there, we'll be first in the lake. And everyone was there with tears down their eyes. Oh, and wow. Was the opening ceremony, which wasn't a problem. Um, so it was our moment. It was our moment. And I really enjoyed being on the lake it was massively hot it was challenging conditions we had our preparation so we got beaten in the heat by the kiwis who were um yeah eventual winners it meant we had to go to the repechage and we got um did our pre-race twice and had the repechage cancelled or postponed twice which was an extraordinary Ooh. go through because we realized on the third day it couldn't be postponed but my brain was sort of is it going to happen now yeah, or yeah, not yeah. anyway we did our repertoire we won that race and so we had demonstrated kind of second in our heat first in our repertoire but we put ourselves into a, a good lane for the final yeah. and it was exciting and of course Elise and I when we crossed the line had, had achieved that dream, not the the shiniest one, but I'd got myself a, and, and she'd got herself a medal. I remember that race. It, it was an outstanding result. Um, and I guess, did you go into that race thinking, you know, we're going for bronze or did you have an open mind or what was your... I think you have to believe that you can get the best result that you turn up for. So absolutely, we wanted to get gold, no doubt about it. We wanted to... Um, finish as high up the field as we could and we thought you know we didn't talk about getting the gold but we talked about how we were going to get the medal zone and finish the race strong so seeing what happened in in that way we in the race we did our sprint for for the line which we usually did um we're a bit inspired by the french from um from sydney yeah Um, we usually do it a minute minute and a half we did it at 7.50, two and, two and a half minutes out. Yeah. And we believed that would um, break up the field, which which it did. And when we were looking at the, the results, we we hoped to be able to you know, beat the Kiwis, but we didn't know that we could, but we definitely knew we had to beat the Bulgarians yeah. and, and get up with the, the Germans to make sure we were in, in, in that medal zone. We'd beaten one of the other crews in our repertoire. So... It really was about making a, that commitment to, to the mood together. We tried it in the wreckage, it worked, it got us into the first place, and then actually the other crews had sat back. So 
we we hadn't done it quite to the finish line, but we tried it. And it yeah. Was and then I, in that race, you know, I, I I had nothing more to give. So we did that move. The boat lifted up. It moved brilliantly. It just was flying. And I remember thinking, okay, that's that's fantastic. Let's just keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. And it, it, we keep it very simple, don't we? 15, 15, 10, 10, yeah. 10, the last 500. And I started to go blind and deaf, Martin. I, my oh, wow. My body went completely to, to the blackness. And I was thinking, well, that's that's good. Jürgen says, go to the blackness and go <laughs> to the other side. And I realized Jürgen was lying. There is no other side to blackness. There's just more blackness and so i just was thinking don't let elise down just don't let elise down and then count to 15 15 10 10 10 and that and i couldn't remember what came after three or four so i just had to count three or four to start at one again and just keep going until i felt elise stop and obviously then i stopped and yeah i had nothing wow. to I was being, it was not pretty <laughs> yeah that's a great story, Sarah. And, and, and obviously, you wanted um, to continue on. You, 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 when you recovered, you liked that. You wanted to continue on for another four years, I guess. Yeah, I did. It was. Um, I just finally having got on the, and that was my first time on the rostrum at a World Championships or an Olympic Games. So I yeah, and it was Olympic and medal and gone the wrong way. So. Yes, it was a bronze, but it was my first one. So we got lots of medals by that point at World Cups. Um, so we, but I hadn't managed to do it at the World Championships or, or a Olympic Championships. So I think having done that, I wasn't prepared to stop because I was the same DNA. I was the same arm and legs. I was the same thinking. I was just doing things slightly better um, yeah. each, each day. And my results were slightly better. But... When you're not on the red rostrum, the chasm can feel so far. But when you are, you're like, okay, I can, I can, I can make that next step. I absolutely can see how this can happen. And you know, that year I put my best ever ergo score going into Athens. I was in great shape. What do you remember? What you pulled? Six twenty-eight point seven. I'm going. Wow! Yeah, yeah, pretty cool. It was okay at the time. I think it was. A, I think it stood for fifteen years, years yeah. over thirties world records. So that was aging me at the time. But I, I was in good form, and the ergo is great, isn't it? Because you you get an honest opinion yeah. of your form, and I I knew I was still improving. So why stop when you're still improving? That was just exciting, and so yeah, went back again, went for the quad and. Well, we put the quad as the first vote, and this time I, I managed to get myself into it. Went to the World Championships of Japan, and finally, finally, in the middle of that rostrum, um, winning the, the gold. Yeah, just how was that for you? I, I mean, you know, pressure on as, as favourites going into that race, perhaps, or not? Ooh, yeah, well, I, we didn't think we were favourites. So we had done really well going into the year that was great we've had good world cups we were looking like we were in really strong but the germans who had been beating well all year they shifted their crew between the um last world cup so lucerne and and the world championships and they put katarina born in there so they basically deprioritized their double and they prioritized their quads so we absolutely knew that the germans which be. had, I don't think they had lost the quad since nine, eight, 94, was it at that point? Yeah. They did yeah. not want to, to lose their title. And they had such a grip on that event at that time. So we had Bourne up against us. I don't know if you remember, but it was on a, I remember we drove into Gifu to this wonderful place in Japan. And there was this big river there. And I just looked at the girls and oh, look, that's what we're racing. Yeah. And like, yeah, you know, that is where you're racing. I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> look at that. You know you think that was a joke. But as you remember, they dammed the river to make a lake, maybe. So it was meant to be really, really still. It was meant to work. I'm sure FISA did all their due, due diligence to um, make sure that was going to happen until a monsoon hit. So we got there, we got the boats out, we got on the lake river and there's some rowing that all was going really well and then this monsoon was due to hit so 
put de rigged all the boats, put them back in the containers. Amazingly, again, and this is where you realize British men, we have such a privilege and advantage that when things get rock, go wrong, there's money to throw at the problem. And we were able to access a large number of ergo, ergos and spend those days on the ergo. So we're back on the lake, which is now flowing like a river in with a monsoon and a flood and got on there and did our prep work. It got slower and slower the next two days. And then, um, of course, we're, we're up against in our, in our heat. And I think I think we won our heat. I can't quite remember. Yeah. And then going through, we knew we were going to have to go up against the Germans in the final. And we were, it was an extraordinary race because I don't think there was probably more than yeah. two or three foot between the two boats the whole time. And uh, we did our first 500 as hard as we possibly could, and it was going well. We knew we wanted the Germans had a better start than us then, so we wanted to stay with them. And yeah. We put absolutely everything we had into the second 500. That was absolutely the strategy. And the Germans <laughs> took about three foot off us, so they went quick. Uh. We got to halfway, having emptied out the whole tank. Um, on that with that plan to, to be ahead and we're I don't know two or three feet behind but we had got into a fantastic river we had Kathleen Granger in our straight seat Rebecca's behind me and um, I've got Fran in, in yeah. front of me and they're just rock solid and so we, we're working through we're working through and then suddenly um, Bex went they've had an accident they've had a mistake <laughs> move and we did that move and wow basically what just happened i think was born and had um let go of her blade and caught a minor minor crab but she got back amazingly quickly but we were able to move just before they could move yeah again. yeah yeah and that meant we beat them i think we beat them by 0.3 of a second it was Feet at the end, but we finished. I'm absolutely convinced with one. Put my hands above my head and then put them down quickly, thinking it's going to trick. We just celebrated it, and, and yeah, it was. It was, and I physically or physiologically, I wasn't in as much trouble. I mean, it wasn't as hot, but as I was when I won the Olympic bronze. Yeah. Um. So it's really interesting, isn't it? When yeah. Your, where you where you have to push your body and what can happen at, at different times to you because all the training we do prepare you to race but when you're racing sometimes you just get over that line and the physiological impact is yeah yeah when you red line it for a bit too long and it, it was a very different experience for you um the, the next year because um I, and i remember that race and and commentating on it with um mm. you know you you were the, the pack grandstands and the russian you were leading the russians and then the russians just got through you in the last mm. part of the race and then mm. uh, and i remember you guys after the race you know inconsolable really um mm. It was massively challenging that year. I mean, we're talking about my career and you think, why did you keep doing it? It really... So we'd come back, Bex Romero had decided two wheels was better than two blades. Yeah. And she's gone off to, to pursue that dream and she won gold in on her bike in Beijing. Just, just extraordinary, just silver and, and then gold in two, in two different sports. And we've been, of course, how we've been working, we... Debbie Flood came and joined us yeah. in the squad. We started the World Cup campaign miles ahead of everyone. We'd, think we'd lost to the Russians once, I think, in a heat maybe or a refreshage at some point, but we'd, got, we'd won every final coming through. And on that day, we it was really fast conditions. It was the fastest I've ever gone in a quad, actually. I think we did 6'11". And wow. And we went out, we, the race kind of went how we intended it to, how it planned yeah. it, and we, we committed to each other. In the last 500, we were just going to bring ourselves in and just finish the race. And so we brought ourselves into the boat and, and finished the race. And, and it's what we've been practicing and intending to do all season. And then when we looked up, we weren't in, in Gotham. Yeah. <laughs> we, 
we've done our best performance, but we've lost Martin. And as you know, you finish your race, you go into the land stage, you deal with the press. And in my head, I think I did that quite well. I, I can't remember. But yeah. I think we held ourselves together. And then I actually got lost on the way to the medal podium because I was crying so hard. I couldn't see, I couldn't follow Debbie, Brown and Kathleen because I just took a wrong turn. And I think we, nothing had gone wrong. We hadn't, we hadn't done anything that we hadn't intended to do. We'd done a fantastic performance and we hadn't got the result we intended to. And it was, just too much to comprehend in the moment, I think. And I'm not, Yeah. you know, I, I was in tears when I got that silver medal. And I remember Kath and I, we were roommates and we went back to our hotel at the Coxhorn Hotel. And a few people, it was the last day of the World Championships. And as you know, there's often a some sort of yeah. celebration and Kath and I didn't feel like going to it. So we just kind of, you know, we are great friends. I'm massively, massively fortunate to have that friendship. And we, we just kept going, well, could we have, what did we, should we have, maybe yeah. we should change the rigging, maybe we, you know, uh, the, did the start, did we get the right rhythm? And we just unpicked everything, I mean, what we did in the last couple of days, was that right? How could we have made it quicker? And one of us, we've sort of got to the point where it's, we're tired and it's, we're in the, the room and we're going to, to, to bed to go to sleep and then, about 15 minutes later, I'll be going, oh, but maybe if we've just done our catches a bit better and then yeah, we, go, yeah. we must stop thinking, we must, must go to sleep. And then Catherine worked there. I think we basically did that for the, the rest of the night and it got to about four in the morning and I think we looked at each other and we were like, oh, we're not going to sleep. <laughs> so I said, well, my, my car's downstairs. We're in the UK because you were at the World Championship and usually get, have to get on a bus and a plane, but we were in the UK. My car was downstairs. I said, let's just go home. Yeah. And so we got in the car, and then we packed right in the car, and then we're like, well, we don't really want to go home. So <laughs> we went, well, what do we do with ourselves? So we ended up going, well, maybe we'll go to Starbucks, because that's where we used to go to in between yeah. trains. We trained at Longridge and went to Starbucks. So we went to Marlow and parked the car and went to look at Starbucks. And what we didn't know was it was a Bank holiday Monday, so Starbucks. Oh was no! And Martin, my face was on the Times, and Starbucks at the time had the Times in there. They used to give them out to customers, or I think you could buy them. And I remember knocking on the door at Starbucks, and they saw us, and I said, "That's my face." <laughs> like, oh God, you had a bad day yesterday. She goes, "Well, we can't, we can't sell you coffee because we're shut. But come in, come in." And they gave us coffee. And we stayed there until Starbucks opened, and we just spent, spent our most of our morning there, just not yeah. knowing what to do with ourselves. Because, I mean, it is only a rowing race, but at the time it yeah. was everything, and it was a home world championships. We were the poster girls. We were literally on yeah, the yeah, yeah. You were. We wanted to make everyone we we knew proud, and and. British rowing crowd and, and we hadn't and it was incredibly incredibly difficult to, to just to even get our heads around it yeah so was it a happy ending or was that an unhappy ending or was that kind of somewhere in the middle I think it wasn't until so the world championships I'm making up were August I can't August bank holiday probably actually as I've just told that yeah. story that that weekend and I think it was in January that we got the information that the Russians had been disqualified because of doping. Um, so that was a lot of months where yeah. we had been really tough on ourselves. Uh, I don't think that was particularly a bad thing, but there was a lot of months where we really sort of looked under every rock and, and re reviewed. Um, I, I think for me, it was unfortunate I'd gone back to that habit of working harder and is the instead and I just honestly had was determined because to, to, to find that extra bit of yeah speed because we'd lost our world championships yeah. and we were and so 
I think I'd worked really hard. I managed to injure my knee really, really badly. Um, I'd snapped my ACL when I was at Millfield. And yeah. I had to re-snap it that, that winter while we, while we were training. Um, so it was a happy ending that we got gold. I had to go and find that silver medal. It was in my room in a corner where I think I'd thrown it <laughs> just after I got home. And you know you unpacking. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just chucked it in, in the corner because I really didn't um, didn't want it. I didn't want it to be true. Um, yeah. And I remember picking it up and it was dusty and thinking I've got to send it back now. And I kind of like it for the first time ever. But it <laughs> me so much. <laughs> but I gave it back. Um, so it was a happy ending. We got gold. We got to get the gold at the team dinner. It yeah, was, I remember the that. Dinner, it was announced and. I think it put a few ghosts to bed for us and for Tomo. Um, but for me, I, I'd injured myself and I had to have a, a massive knee injury, um, a knee operation. I missed the 2007 World Championships. I was learning to walk while they were racing and Annie Vernon took my place and they put a fantastic race together. It was brilliant to see. And then, of course, I didn't get back in the quad for Beijing, um, and I got to race in the eight for that. Yeah. Race. So, yeah. And you, you had, you had an illness in that eight, didn't you? We did it. Like when you look back, it's getting ill and injured at the wrong time. I think could be the the method of or, or the the playbook of my career. But actually, I I hope it's the friendships and the learning and the the the, the way I learned about myself, not not the illnesses and the injuries. But yes, we did. We went to Beijing we'd got a I came into the eight late I really really enjoyed it and loved being part of that project if I look about myself in Sydney with Fran and I think I probably wasn't at my best for much of that and hopefully if you ask for, to my teammates in the eight when I came in I, I really enjoyed it and I really hope I made a difference for them and, and with them and we got a bronze in uh, the World Cup, for the uh, last World Cup that I was in, and we, you could feel there was good yeah. speed. Um, and then we went to the games, and we came second in our heat behind the Americans. The break felt fantastic. I was really, really excited. And then in our repechage, just a couple of days later, we came fourth, and we got through to the final, but the boat just was not seen, yeah. just didn't feel fast and, and right. And, I just we couldn't put our fingers on it, and then a day later, people started to get yeah, yeah, and we're dropping. We were as a group dropping like flies, and and incredibly, this we we ended up using the pair in the final for the paired race on the Saturday. They came and raced with us on the on the Sunday and the eighth. I think four of us were so ill we wouldn't have trained on a normal day, and we had our Olympic final, and somehow this. The performance was fifth. We we beat the yeah. Australians and it got halfway, Martin. And I thought, my God, this crew is so bloody gutsy. We're going to do it. It just felt amazing. I thought we're going to we're going to get uh, another medal. This is going to we're going to do it. And then we went to put the afterburners on, and there just wasn't that power and pizzazz in there because we were ill. <laughs> you know, yeah. We were just, yeah. And, and, and yeah, we weren't good enough to get an Olympic medal when you're not well. And yeah, how, how easy how easy was it for you to call it a day after those games? Well, I came back and did another winter, and anyone who's done a winter's training will know that that probably means it's not that easy. <laughs> <laughs> I came back and I I just wanted to try and race my single. I just thought you know, that mirror of where what I'd done in Croatia, made, I just needed some time and after all those ups and downs to get my head right and not have to interact in a crew. I think I, I always hoped that in a crew I was adding to it, I often ended up doing the calls rightly or wrongly and I felt I had to give a lot to that group dynamic and I didn't have that in me, Martin. I was... I think physically, emotionally exhausted after Beijing. And I thought if I could recover in the single, yeah. not have to only have to worry about myself, it would give me time to get back. And I thought I'd probably go as far as 2010. I actually, even with London, didn't think I had that in me. But 
um, I thought, you know, New Zealand, Kaipiro, what an amazing way to finish um, where I was. Or I'd get halfway in and then see if I had two more years in me. And I had a pretty good winter. I really enjoyed it. I went for Age Croft. I trained with Martin McElroy. I tried yeah. to do some different things. I wanted to get back. I got coached by Harry Mann, Ian Dryden, as long as well as Rod and Roger when I was at Cambridge. And there was this real feel of the boat that they had given me in those days. And I wanted the opportunity to get back to that and do that again. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That kid that could do make 28 and, and come second. And, and maybe I wasn't that kid anymore, but actually without really that much um, you know, background of training behind me, I, I was able to get that, that result. And it, I did it through how I was sculling at that time. So I tried to get back to that. I tried to put a few things in place, did pretty well early, early season and then got to trials and Catherine uh, beat me at trials. And in fact, I think I came third or fourth at that final trials, maybe even fifth. I can't quite remember. But what it meant was I couldn't do the signal. And yeah. that went on, as we know, to have got an amazing silver silver medal. In yeah. that boat, and I stepped away. It was. And was it easy? I remember I actually Brit Kajit Proctor again. I spoke to her straight after trials. I was in yeah. the Winkle and I was like Brit, this is what's happened. And I don't know, Martin, if she said to me this hundreds of times before, but I never heard it before. She just said, Sarah, you don't have to do this anymore. Wow. And I went, I don't. I don't have to do this anymore. And it was amazing because once I had thought that and I'd agreed if I didn't have to do it, the whole rest of the world opened up and I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I need to find something quick. But uh, I don't have to do this. And I stepped away. Um, I came back in, actually. Um, Cash Howard got an injury. She'd been in the eight. She was then the yeah. four. And I went and rode with them a few times, which I, I loved. I was able to yeah. help them a small bit. And I raced in the eight at Henley, which was an amazing privilege. Yeah. They had an injury just before the eight. It was three months after I'd retired by that point. But I got to step into that eight, row in the seven seat, and race with pretty much my Beijing eight, which was or yeah. Beijing eight, which was just a, an amazing thing to do because so many of us hadn't had that opportunity to show what we were capable of. So, and I remember um, Caroline saying to me, "I thought, like, Sarah, you have to come and do the world. You know, this and um, this is, but but I couldn't. I just yeah. didn't want to." Yeah. Um, and I wanted to do other things. And so many people by that point in that three months had given me their time, their knowledge, their experience. They had conversations with me about things I, I could do. Um, I felt I needed to go and pursue some of those as well. Mm -hmm. Sarah, I wanted to ask you about Huntingdon's. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, one of the most inspirational things about you is is your your the way you work as an ambassador and and, and the way that you um, live with the knowledge you've got the Huntingdon's gene. Mm -hmm. People watching might not know what that what that is. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wonder if you could maybe explain and, um, and and tell a bit of that story. Yeah, of course, it's. Um... The brain degenerative disease is the nice title of it. Um, it affects your mood, mood, memory and movement, really. So mum, when I was in my teenage years, started to really change. And it's interesting being part of the rowing family because even then we'd go to Henley every, yeah. every year. And it's a family. Huntington's can happen so gradually that you don't really notice things are changing. It's, mm. Mum's just different, difficult at times, um, but we didn't really notice how far and far she was declining until you go to Henley. People who hadn't seen her for a year, for a year. would really see the difference. They wouldn't be able to understand her speech because what was happening was her muscles were losing their her control. She was using her yeah. control muscles, so that's not only stomach, it's void. It, voice, its movement, and all, all of those things were happening. And it wasn't until I was at Cambridge that I learned that mum had Huntington's because we didn't know. Yeah. Um, and that meant I had a 50-50 chance of inheriting the gene. I, I pretty much straight away went to find out. I was 
young, the brain repair center was just down the road. And yeah. It all sounded very positive. So I popped down there and had six months of counseling before I found out my um, positive test. So basically, I, I, I have the gene and I will get ill as, as mum did. And mum died of it two, two years ago. And pretty much when I started my rowing, I didn't really share it very widely. I didn't hide it, but yeah. I didn't share it either. And you know, when you're young at that point, with partners and things, you wouldn't particularly share it with them. Again, I didn't hide it, but I didn't share it. Because when yeah. you tell someone I've got a brain degenerative disease and it's going to happen at some point, you don't know when. And so I, those I really trusted and I thought might support me of course they knew about it but it wasn't something I advertised in any way until actually in 2004 when I got the opportunity after doing one of the world cups I remember I doubled yeah. in racing with Elise in the double I also ended up racing in the quad we got medals at both and suddenly I, I have to do a lot of press because I've just had a great yeah. day at the office and Kathy Wood who at the time was working for the Daily Mail had asked me a few questions about mum and where she had been and I hadn't really thought why I would talk about how I would talk about mum in that scenario yeah yeah what transpired is eventually Kathy and I got talking off the record and she offered to do an article in the Daily Mail about Huntington for me and I got full editorial control of it it was before the Olympic Games so I had to think about it. I remember talking to my dad wow. about it and my yeah. stepdad about it and my siblings about it. And I remember talking about my partner at the time about it. And he said, well, you've never told me that you've got hunting. <laughs> it was a very new relationship. So I was like, well, I have now. Um, so, <laughs> and I'm probably about to tell the world or the Daily Mail readership Um and it was scary to do, but it felt like the one thing I could do that might make a difference. I didn't know whether I'd ever have that platform again. I didn't, yeah. I felt by talking about it, I might help someone in my situation. At the time, I didn't know the size of the community particularly, but it felt like something positive I, I could do. I didn't necessarily want to do it. I quite liked having my secrecy. Yeah. But then at least I was never going to have to worry when I was going to tell a boyfriend about it again. Not going to have to go in the toilet at a wedding and ask me if I have a gene, which had happened to me in the past. So I think there was a sort of, okay, well, this at least will be out there in the open. And I got a really positive response, quiet but positive from that yeah. article. And when I retired, I got a really positive response from the Huntingdon community. And I got invited to be patron for Scottish um, Huntingdons. And I started to be able to go and support young carers. And I went to the, um, the Scottish Huntingdons Association asked me, and not because I was Scottish, but because yeah. they asked me for something. And they said, would I be patron? And I said, yeah, I will. But only if you're going to use me in a proper, active way. And so they took me, we have to do a young carers camp, obviously not last year, but every year where young carers get to be kids and they have get to be outdoors and meet people who are in the same situation then and it's amazingly important for them. And so I try and go to that every year. I'll just wow. show myself I hate heights and I abseil for them pretending I'm not scared and go in canoes and just have a, a lovely time and then we usually do a bit of education on one of the days for the older kids just to make sure they have the right messaging and they're able yeah. to ask the right questions so it's a really important thing so i said oh I, can i go on the summer camp if i'm patron <laughs> <laughs> and obviously they said yes and and from that everything else has grown really and i i do think it it makes a difference to be able to talk about it um to talk about your good and bad days with the diagnosis yeah. and touch wood I, I'm well I stay well at the moment and long may that continue yeah and are there are there more treatments available now than there used to be or or uh, hope yeah, for a cure you or... asked me that question six months ago I'll tell you really bouncy about or in fact three months ago about an amazing trial so there was there was real, real hope in our community. And um, so there's 
being there was a new way of um, adding getting non-mutant Huntington's into the brain. They were trialing it on 900 people globally. They managed to um, keep this study going on during COVID. And I've got to know the researchers over the years, so I've been asked to speak at various things. And they've, um, they were so, so excited. So they absolutely believed this was the, the dawn that the community had been waiting for. And about two months ago, two of the, the two trials were, were pulled. They're, they're not working. Um, they're not uh, working with human patients. And so that, I, I know we'll learn loads from it as a community. Yeah, yeah. But they're, so to answer your question, are there treatments? No, not at the moment, not good ones yet. So it, I think it probably still remains the most curable, non-curable disease because yeah. there's so such deep understanding However, it's yeah, feels a long way away again. So yeah, <laughs> I, I'm I'm guessing just turning back to rowing now, Sarah. Um, that people um, who maybe uh, coming to rowing more latterly will know you more as an umpire. Um, so how? how was it that you took to umpiring because you've made such an impact in that sort of area of the sport yeah i mean i i, I left international rowing in love with our sport i absolutely still love going out in my single skull i love going out in crew boats whether they're with my ex-international friends or i've gone out recently in pubs boats and oh really, wow really enjoyed it i just absolutely love being on the water i love stay fit um, and I, I absolutely believe it does help me with with my health and um, for, the, for the hunting doing so I didn't really intend to be an umpire because umpires commit so much time and they're not they're, they're not helping you stay fit in, in that way so it wasn't part of the plan yeah and uh, in fact I did some coaching I managed to coach a crew to a heavy final all of those oh things. wow I didn't want to do lots of coaching but I did love it so you know was, was really trying to contribute to the sport and at least when you're coaching you're on a bicycle so I was staying vaguely fit with it and um, when the women's boat race was coming to the tideway the, those who were involved at a deep level suddenly realised they'd need some female umpires from Oxford yeah. and Cambridge to do that so those who, for those who don't know Oxford and Cambridge provide the umpires for the men's boat race and they're usually uh, alumni of that race so they were beginning to think about who might be able to do it, who knew the tideway, who was uh, somebody who would be able to sort of stand up in front of the groups and be credible and yeah, might, yeah. might become an umpire. And I got asked by Anna Marie Phelps. Um, wow. At the time, I said no. I was recently retired. I was doing a huge amount of volunteer work with the Huntington's charity. Yeah. I was doing some work with fit, um, my... Fitzwilliam's old old um, college. Wearing, I was doing all sorts of fits volunteer, and I was full. I just thought, there's no way you can add this to to what you're already doing. You're gonna not be able to afford to eat because you're gonna earn nothing. You have no time left. So I said no, and then I reflected, and I thought, are you saying no because of the time, or are you yeah. saying no because you're scared? Oh wow. Was, because when I thought about umpiring that race, the boat race, or the women's boat race, as it was going to, the, 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 the journey was going to take me to, I was, I oh thought, my God, that's a stretch. That's an incredible thing to do. I remember watching my first boat race and always being part of it. And having done our boat races at Henley, they were yeah. in special kingdom, if you like, and I loved them and they got me hooked on rowing. But actually, the Putney spectacle is is an incredible thing, and I reflected and thought, actually, are you just scared? Are you just saying no because it's a too big a thing, and you don't want to stretch yourself in that way? And once I thought that, Martin, I had to have a go because <laughs> I'm not someone to step away from something that scares me and. I had a conversation with Anna Marie and I said, look, what's it going to take? 
and it became clear that I should become a British rowing umpire, which I started the process with, and then yeah. um, process to learn about circulation patterns and things like <laughs> as, a, as a rower, which I should never ever confess. I was good at being in the right place on time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm right place in the warm up lake, I'm not so sure. Um, and, and just to learn about all of that, I got mentored by Barbara Wilson, who actually was part of um, Oxford set up at the time, but she was mentioning me as a British rowing umpire. And I got to look at regattas in different ways. So I started to do that. And then I got invited along to the umpires panel and started shadowing those who were doing it. So, yeah. So, and, I remember I was lucky enough to be given, be, to be Matt, Matt Pinson's assistant that first or second year, and I got to be on the front of the launch with no real responsibility because Matt was absolutely all over what he had to do. Yeah, yeah. Watching the boat race, I'm thinking, oh my God, this is what a privilege. What a yeah, yeah, yeah. Really privilege this is. And so. Yeah, I just kept coming back. I kept learning, listening, getting feedback on what I was doing, intending to make myself better each time. And of course, that led me to the first year. Christine Wilson, who was the Oxford coach, I think was incredibly nervous about controlling everything. And I ended up not umpiring that race, came to providing that Simon Harris. Yeah. After that race. Then Gold, uh, Blondie Osiris came on to the tideway, and I ended up umpiring them the day after, or the day before actually. Yeah, day before. From a running start, so I'd umpired a race. Um, but what Christine had done unwittingly was uncouple the sex of the umpire with the race, because yeah. Simon Harris clearly is a male, and yeah. he'd done the women's race. And so what I don't think any of us realised was that over the next few years, that would mean that I would end up umpiring the men's boat race, um, which I did this year, of course. Yeah, yeah, which is really cool. And and just, I mean, so many firsts. I think, were you the first lady umpire at Henley? Yeah, yeah, I was, I was, yeah. That was a, a few years ago now, yeah. Yeah. Um, it was one of those days, Martin, where I was still, I love racing at Henley, and I was thinking about doing a quad with a group of women. I think we'd have been okay. And Steve had a conversation with me about perhaps doing the umpiring or doing some umpiring because he wanted to develop more than the small yeah. groups of umpires. I thought oh, that's great, Steve. I think you're racing, but that's okay. But umpire win. Well, you're okay with that. And Steve looked at me and he went, you have to choose. Why? But I chose, I chose umpiring. Yeah. That's a good, that's an interesting choice. The mm -hmm. thing is, Sarah, I, it, it's so fascinating talking to you. I, I, I just, I just kind of want to get into, you know, some of the other things you do. Like I know, you know, you were the first female chair of the British Olympic Association's Athletes Commission. You, you were, know well, Martin. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, well, a, a really important role. And then you, you were also on, um, on the, I, I, I don't know the specific name of the committee you're on, but the, the doping. The doping one, yes. Yeah. So UK Anti-Doping. UK anti -doping. I'm a non-exit director. This is my fifth year, so I will be timed out after in March next year. But I've spent six years, well, I will have spent six years, um, supporting that organisation to be the best it can be. Clearly, it's massively important to me. And I yeah. think we've chaired their Athletes Commission, so it's been a real insight actually of um supporting those who want to catch those who cheat or protect the clean athletes yeah is there is there anything if you look back on your time you know working in that um that you feel you know massively proud of um I sense think, of achievement i mean it's an it's an incredibly complex um organization and we what we're trying to to do is um always online but i think how i developed the athletes commission there has been really really good so i've been able to um get that voice of the athlete so there was a, the, there's two sides of the organization there's the education side who absolutely know athletes and will think about how they work and how they educate them then there's those who are trying to catch cheating athletes who 
while do know you do know athletes that they're, they're seeing them as oh my god there's amazing performance how, how have they done that have they cheated yeah and, yeah and they you know if someone had to, does a whereabouts failure i mean god what's that why what are they trying to hide and i think what i've been able to do is help them understand what an athlete's life is like and through the commission see different nuances of of athletes life so they can understand that somebody might be doing a whereabouts filing failure because they're trying to avoid but actually they might just be having to deal with the complexity and all disorganization of an athlete's life and so i hope i've worked with them just to shift that mindset a bit because naive or not and i have lost a medal to, to doping which yeah said, but i do believe that most athletes are competing clean or intending to complete clean yeah me too support them with that and and that's that's incredibly incredibly important to me um so um we haven't mentioned the work you do um because uh, people might feel surprised that you've got time for any work um, I feel surprised in terms of what uh, you know what you've been talking about time. but you do work don't you i do work i do work i'm, I'm incredibly fortunate i work in team development so I, I did psychology as part of my degree and being fascinated by the brain i fascinated by the brain going wrong and with huntington's and potentially my own thinking with psychology, the psychologist. So I've sort of managed to marry those um, fascinations with work. So I managed to become a leader within sports, I suppose. So chef de mission of the Commonwealth Games, and I did that last role in 2018. But the most of the work I do is in leadership and coaching. So I'll support other people to be at their best and teams to, be, to work together and operate. To a, to a higher level, which is yeah. incredible. I, I mean, I know you do similar similar stuff. And when you you see someone and they're able to communicate at a better level, they're able to operate a performative different level. It's just a, the most amazing privilege that you'll see. So I love it. Absolutely love it. And um, we started, and, and we talked about you and, and at school, and and uh, you know a, a great crowd of girls starting off, and the, the sadness that that had, had diminished. As you look at um, sport for young women now, for for girls now, is it any different? Do you think it's have, have things moved on? Yes, I really think there's so many more options now, aren't they? So we were offered, if you like, uh, athletics in the summer. I think you could play tennis. Um, I obviously did the uh, athletics and netball and hockey in the winter, and those were really your options at the school I was at. I didn't understand the world rules for hockey, and um, the stick was too short. So netball it was. Um, I loved it. Don't get me wrong, I absolutely loved it, but there weren't many choices. And when there's only seven people in a netball team, that means that the rest don't always get a look in. So I see lots more choices. I see young women playing rugby playing, football, I see activity being seen rather than sport because I hear so many people saying I'm not good at sport and all I say is you didn't have the opportunity to develop your skills before the time that somebody judged you. Yeah, Definitely yeah, not yeah, good at yeah. Sport, but you weren't as a, I was so lucky as a young girl, I had a brother who was 14 months older than me, I had a dad and a mum who took me out. We were physical. We lived near the woods in Henley. We'd be out there. And I was developing my physical capacity. And so when I got into a sporting environment and was tested, I was deemed good at sport at that point yeah. and encouraged. And it makes me incredibly sad that people turn off physical activity because they think they couldn't catch the ball at that first tested point. Um, so I think it is better. We still, as you know, have huge dropout in teenage years for young men and women, actually. And yeah. we have to keep, uh, as a society, we're going to be happier, more successful if we're active, whatever that looks like. It doesn't have to be sport. You don't have to be beating someone, but actually being active and getting physically out into the environment for me is incredibly important. And it wow. certainly has kept me... Um, so happy and sane during lockdown and I've got a new dog 
who has managed not to bark through most of this. I've, I've been amazed at that because I heard it. Is it a he or a she? It's a she. She's I... years old. She's a labradoodle. Oh, well, I heard her at the beginning just before we went live, and she's been so good. What's, she, what's she called? Harlan, after, after a beach in Cornwall. Oh, wow, that's that's superb. Sarah, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure You're talking to somebody like I, like yourself. And I, I know that you're an inspiration to, to, you know, hundreds and thousands of people in tens of thousands in the work that you do. Um, but you've been so bubbly and, and those stories have been great. This has been a very, very special Crosses Corner, I must say. Thank you. Well, I didn't know we were going down memory lane, but thank you for taking me there. It's been a, a nice to read with us all. So we'll end the live part of this interview now. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Thanks for watching, and uh, I hope you enjoy more of Cross's Corner. Bye for now. <laughs>